Jim Rickards argues that energy prices will go higher and worse. He says that the price of the war between Ukraine and Russia will be paid by the whole world. He predicts that a serious crisis will await Europe in the world, especially in the coming winter. He says that there will be a serious crisis especially for wheat and people will have difficulty in finding it. He suggests people to protect their investment by buying gold to prepare for the next biggest financial crisis. Listen to the full podcast to understand what's going on the global market, and are we witnessing a serious inflation crisis? Please follow us on YouTube and open your notifications for further podcasts. Enjoy. Let's talk about uh, the economic war once the kinetic war, as you say, is over. And, uh, you know, you say Russia is not a punching bag that takes hits without hitting back. You cite, for example, Russia will be teaming up with China to roll out the Chinese credit card system for Russian consumers. This comes after Visa and MasterCard ended all business with Russia. Their efforts won't end there. So let's start with that. This how we might see this power play emerge between China and Russia or this teaming up, this partnership. Right. Well, let's start let's start with the sanctions and then pivot over to how China can replace a lot of other points of contact in terms of the Russian economy. Um, these sanctions will not work to stop the war or slow the war or change the outcome of the war. Now, they absolutely punish the Russian economy. Yep. They punish Russian individuals, consumers, Russian citizens. They're going to have fewer options, uh, more expensive goods. Um, you know, their economy is going to slow down. Unemployment will go up. The ruble is devalued. All those things are true. But they're also true in the United States. We're going to punish Americans far worse than the Russians. Uh, we're already seeing I took a long trip yesterday. Uh, I filled up my car with gas at the end of the trip. It was $76. It used to be 40, 45 bucks to fill up my car. Now it's $76. Yeah. Not quite doubling. Well, multiply that by 200 million cars and every consumer in the United States uh, and elsewhere in the world. You're, you're, you're seeing the impact of this already. It's not like, oh, gee, it's coming. It's already here. It's going to get a lot worse. Um, and when I say a lot worse, I'm not just talking about prices um, you know, in the grocery store, which are going to go up a lot. They, they have gone up already. I mean, inflation's already here. Watch what's going to happen. Ukraine's kind of one of their nicknames um, is the breadbasket of Europe. They provide about, uh, Russia and Ukraine together provide about 25% of the grain exports in the world. Um, and, you know, pick your country, but when you get to Africa, there are countries in Africa where they get almost 100% of their grain from Ukraine. Lebanon gets 100% of its grain from Ukraine. Those people are going to starve because uh, the Russians have taken over the Sea of Azov. Um, they're working on the, the Black Sea port. So Odessa is the big one that's left, but Odessa is in their sights. Not That'll be uh, a month to six weeks away because they gotta they got to finish up uh, Mariupol and uh, connect the line from uh, uh, Kharkiv to uh, Donetsk and then extend through Crimea. So they have a lot of work to do in the south and the east to consolidate that. But then they'll turn, to, and Kiev's last. Everyone's like, uh, oh, gee, you know, Putin had a three-day blitzkrieg in Kiev and he didn't do it, so he's failed. That's not true. Where did that come from? That's a, that's a Western propaganda narrative to set up Putin as a failure. That was never Putin's plan. Have you seen the Russian battle plans? I haven't, but I can. I know what they're doing just by looking at their operations. Kiev is last on the list. They want to get Odessa first, but when they do, and this may already be the case because the Russian Navy is in the in the Black Sea, there are there are not going to be any exports from Ukraine, and the U.S. has banned most exports from. Russia. Uh, and Russia has retaliated by saying, we're not going to export you anyway. Even if you didn't have a ban, you're on our ban list, a banned list. So, um, so, but you take 25% of the world's grain exports off the market. Tell me what that does to the price of wheat. And by the way, wheat's not just a loaf of bread. Most grain is used to feed livestock. So it goes straight through the price of pork, uh, chicken, uh, beef, etc. You're looking at things doubling or more. Um, and then yeah, that's if you can get it. Then behind that are shortages. Now, we had a supply chain breakdown before any of this started. The supply chain broke, has been breaking mm -hmm. down in stages over the last several years. That became acute last fall. And everyone's like, oh, well, yeah, give it a month. We'll sort things out. No, it's getting worse. And now you put the Ukraine war on top of that and the economic sanctions on top of that. It's going to get a lot worse. So, um, but... So that's, those are some of the economic effects, and those are the easy ones. I'll give you an example of a more difficult one. So, uh, you know, we kick Russia and their 10 biggest banks out of SWIFT. Uh, you know, that's the, you yeah. know what that is. That's the worldwide um, uh, uh, banking uh, telecommunications uh, facility. 
Um, so you can't use SWIFT to move money around, uh, kick them out of the, the dollar payment system, uh, you know, did a long list of things. Can't trade Russian bonds, can't receive, can't send, et cetera. Well, the other day, uh, the Central Bank of Russia paid dollar interest on their external dollar denominated bonds. And uh, everyone was like, wait a second, I thought we had sanctions. I thought we kicked them out of the system. Here, Russia's paying, uh, they have about $150 billion of external dollar denominated debt. They had a big payment coming up, interest payment, and they paid it. Like, how did that work? Well, two things. Number one, um, people, you got to read, I've actually read all these sanctions. It's a couple, a couple hundred pages at this point. But in the fine print, a lot of these things have ex delayed effective dates. Uh, they were issued in late February, early March, but they had 30, 60, or 90 day delays in the effective date, depending on the sanction. So most of them aren't even in place yet, uh, number one. Number two, uh, somebody at the Treasury finally woke up and said, well, wait a second. If we tell Russia they can't pay the debt, uh, who loses from that? They keep the money, and our, our bondholders, it's American bondholders who lose money. It's the, it's the creditor who loses out when the debtor can't pay. Where are those bonds? Well, you'd be surprised. A lot of them are in BlackRock. Uh, they could be in, in uh, someone's 401k. Like, I didn't buy any Russian bonds. Well, did you buy an emerging market ETF from Morgan Stanley? Because there could be some Russian bonds in there. I mean, take a look. But my point is, this is where, when I made the comment, what happens in Russia doesn't stay in Russia, when you tell the Russians that they can't pay their debt, and so debt starts to falling all over the world, you don't know where it's going to pop up. But you're now playing, this is why I use the nuclear war analogy, you're playing with a global liquidity crisis. Because that's how these things can evolve very quickly, as we saw in uh, 2008 and uh, 1998. There's also now, you know, in terms of more sanctions, proposed legislation in the U.S. Senate to freeze gold reserves head by the Central Bank of Russia, but you say, you know, good good luck with that. Because that, that is one question that I was thinking, like, why wouldn't Russia, or would they sell some of their gold to get out of this mess? Well, uh, the only way to free go, freeze gold, we're talking about physical bullion, by the way, that they have in Russia. Apparently some of it's outside of Russia. I don't know exactly how much, but some of it may. It's foolish to leave your gold with the Federal Reserve or the Bank of England, because that's just, might as well just sign it over to the, uh, the exchequer. But, uh, but most of it's in Russia, but some of it is not. But the only way to freeze the physical bullion in Russia is to leave it out in the cold, because that's that's the beauty of a, a physical bullion, which is it's not digital, it's not in some account, and you can't freeze it. Now, what they did, just to be a little bit technical, Daniela, they, the penny legislation says, well, yeah, we can't actually seize the gold without sending the 101st Airborne into Moscow, which, of course, we're not going to do. But uh, if you sell the gold, we're going to freeze the proceeds. So it basically, it immobilizes the gold. It's actually what Goldfinger was doing in that old James Bond movie from 1964. Everyone, at least in the movie version, everyone thought Goldfinger was going to like take the gold out of Fort Knox. That was not the plan. The plan was to make it radioactive so it couldn't be used, and then that way he could corner the market. So what we're saying is, um, if you sell the gold, we're going to seize the proceeds, so therefore you can't sell it, therefore it's no good to you. Uh, that has some impact, but it's not exactly true, and here's why. You can put that gold on a plane, fly it to China, and unload it in a, you know, a secure PLA um, air, um, you know, air force uh, or, or air red wing base in China and use it to pay for whatever you want. So you, you can, it's, 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 it's either barter, or if you want to say gold is money, which is how I look at it, it's just, just delivering the cash in, in gold form.